Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 3, Graces Denied. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last time, we covered the religious policy of Charles I and Archbishop William Lord in the English Church. In this episode, we'll be crossing the Irish Sea to one of Charles's other kingdoms, Ireland. As we covered last season, Stuart Island was a complex mix of religious, cultural and political factions. Religiously, the majority of Irish subjects were Catholic, The Reformation hadn't made much headway among the population, at least compared to England and Scotland. This was despite almost a century of official pressure to convert. This pressure came in many forms. As in England, recusancy fines were imposed on those who failed to attend Church of Ireland services, though various Lord Deputies could be more or less proactive in collecting them. Catholics were unable to serve in various positions from the judiciary to political office. Most dangerously, Catholic landowners were at risk of their property being seized for plantation by English and Scottish Protestants, and this danger threatened not just the Gaelic Irish, but the Anglo-Irish as well. As a reminder, the Gaelic Irish, or Old Irish, were the descendants of the pre-Norman native population. The Anglo-Irish, or the Old English, were the descendants of those Norman invaders, and the New English were the Protestant elites, which had arrived since the Reformation and now held most political power. The political situation was never static, and an opportunity to secure Catholic rights emerged as war between the Stuart kingdoms and first the Spanish and later the French erupted. In the mind of the governing elite, Ireland remained, as it had been 30 years before, the unbolted gate of the British Isles. With a population of dubious loyalty and an understrength garrison, an enemy force could land on Irish shores and threaten the other two kingdoms. So, the Anglo-Irish gentry proposed solutions that would, in theory, address Catholic concerns and secure the island from foreign invasion. Their first suggestion, that they be permitted to raise and lead their own armed forces on behalf of the Crown, was terrifying to the New English, It had been policy ever since the Nine Years' War to disarm the Gaelic and Anglo-Irish. They were not just about to undo that. So instead, in return for a collection of reforms that became known as the Graces, the government would receive generous taxation to pay for an army. These Graces included general toleration of Catholics, allowing them to serve in positions that had otherwise been barred to them. Perhaps the grace which would prove to have the greatest ramifications was the one which would secure Catholic land rights. With this, the power of the crown to continue plantation would be highly limited, if not outright ended. Unfortunately, the graces had not been agreed by the time that the wars ended, and without the danger of imminent invasion, the graces were dropped by the government. They still remained a powerful symbol and aim for Catholics, After all, they had come so close. At the end of Season 1, Episode 37, we saw off Lord Deputy Falkland, who had overseen the negotiations over the Graces. His replacement as Lord Deputy would be Sir Thomas Wentworth. Wentworth's career is interesting. He was made a Knight of the Shire in Yorkshire in 1614, alongside one Sir John Saville, and would be elected to the Adult Parliament of 1614. In this parliament, Wentworth kept relatively quiet, though from his notes it's clear that he favoured a compromise between James and his parliament. In 1615, Wentworth became the Keeper of Records in the West Riding of Yorkshire, on the suggestion of Saville, who was his predecessor in this position. Saville had been removed and summoned to Star Chamber on charges of fraud, and he apparently believed that Wentworth would make an adequate placeholder. Once he returned from London, with his name cleared, the younger man would surely step aside. Saville duly returned from London, 
not only with his reputation restored, but with the backing of the up-and-coming George Villiers. It was through Villiers that Wentworth was asked to resign his position, but Savile had badly disjudged Wentworth. Citing the damage it would do to his honour as a gentleman, he refused. It might justly be taken as the greatest disgrace that could be done unto me. Villiers accepted his refusal, but the royal favourite would keep this resistance in mind. It also caused an irreparable rift between Wentworth and Savile, which would dominate both of their careers over the next decade and a half. To try and protect himself from his newfound rival, Wentworth cultivated friends at court, including the Lord Treasurer Lionel Cranfield. In 1620, Wentworth once again sought to become a Knight of the Shire in Yorkshire, though this time Savile was his opponent rather than colleague. The election was steeped in accusations of voter intimidation, and it was discussed in the House of Commons. Wentworth was once again elected to Parliament in 1620, and once again he pursued a conciliatory policy between King and Parliament, defending the rights and prerogatives of both. In this vein, Wentworth criticised those who tried to pressure the Crown into foreign wars, while also supporting those MPs who pursued the King and Buckingham over monopolies. He defended his position to his constituents by pointing out that the King, Lords and Commons had to work together for the greater good of the Kingdom. He attempted to be a calming influence for the rest of the parliamentary session, but nevertheless James dissolved the body in the beginning of 1622. The next few years of Wentworth's life are a running battle between himself and his friends versus his enemies both in Yorkshire and at court, gaining and losing offices as tides changed. In his personal life, he spent much of 1622 to 1624 ill, losing his London home and his first wife, Margaret, in 1622. While their marriage had begun without much passion, throughout her illness Wentworth stayed by her bedside, reading psalms to her and praying with her, and her death caused him to withdraw from public life. He was clearly quite affected by her death, and when he emerged from his grief and his own illness in 1624, he found the political scene much changed. Wentworth remained opposed to foreign wars, but relations with the Habsburgs had become so rotten that even Charles, Prince of Wales, was calling for war. While he did return to Parliament in 1624, so too did Savile. Once again, Wentworth firmly seated himself on the fence. He spoke against the impositions in line with much of the Commons, yet defended his former patron Cranfield against calls for impeachment. Otherwise, his role in the 1624 Parliament was uneventful. With the accession of Charles, Wentworth increasingly found himself opposing royal policy. Partly, this was due to Wentworth's connections and alignment with opponents of Buckingham, but it helped that he genuinely disagreed with many decisions of the Crown. In 1625, he remarried, this time to Arabella Holles, daughter of John Holles, the Earl of Clare, who was himself taking a leading role in his opposition to Charles's policies. For the election of 1625, Wentworth faced off against Savile once more, though this time he had Sir Thomas Fairfax as his running mate. Yes, that Sir Thomas Fairfax. The Wentworth-Fairfax ticket was declared to have won, though this was because the sheriff said they had, and closed the polling station. This decision was debated in the Commons, and Wentworth courted controversy by taking his seat anyway. Sir John Eliot was mid-speech when he entered the chamber and made a scene. The election was rerun, and Wentworth won anyway. Wentworth had not ruled out reconciling with Buckingham, and so avoided openly attacking the Duke and instead returned to his well-worn position on the fence. If he was too compliant, he risked losing the faith of his constituents, and so he dragged his feet on taxation. This got him noticed by the King, and not in a good way. After Charles dissolved Parliament in August, Wentworth was appointed as Sheriff of Yorkshire in November 1625. Yay for him! Except not yay. This was done, on Buckingham's advice, to prevent Wentworth from being elected to Parliament when it was summoned the following month. Locked out of Parliament, and in his view unjustly, Wentworth sought advancement elsewhere. 
He applied to become Lord President of the North, as the incumbent was expected to retire. Instead, the incumbent stayed in his position, and the Vice Presidency went to Saville. Later in 1626, he was demoted, removed from positions he had held since 1615. With his enemies on the rise in Yorkshire and at court, Wentworth had little choice but to more openly back the opponents of Buckingham, which included his father-in-law, the Earl of Clare. When the forced loan was ordered in 1627, Wentworth refused to pay. He was summoned to face the Privy Council and explain himself, but he claimed he was ill and couldn't travel. When that excuse ran out, Wentworth stood his ground and still refused to pay. He was arrested and imprisoned in Marshalsea Prison in June. Throughout all of this, Wentworth threaded the needle between making a principled stand, keeping his reputation in Yorkshire, while also avoiding anything which might turn the king against him forever. This worked. He petitioned the king for release and was out of prison by the end of the year. His time in prison marked him as a shoo-in for the subsequent elections. He was, after all, a martyr. And at the 1628 Parliament, Wentworth only slightly veered from his traditional path of compromise between Parliament and King. His caution was rewarded with two baronies, becoming Baron Wentworth of Wentworth Woodhouse and Baron Newmarch and Oversley in July 1628. Yet the day before, Saville had himself been made Baron of Pommifret. Wentworth had not won, but he was at least still in the game. Now, Baron Wentworth's apparent switching of sides, from the principled critic of the crown to now, to now eagerly accepting royal patronage, earned him scorn in Parliament and back in Yorkshire. Yet his star was only beginning to rise. The assassination of Buckingham removed one of the single greatest obstacles to his career, as despite multiple and somewhat successful attempts to win the Duke over, he had repeatedly blocked Wentworth's aims and supported those of his enemies. His violent removal, which we covered back in Season 1, Episodes 31 and 32, ended this state of affairs. All the power and influence which Buckingham had collected for himself was now up for grabs. It was a chaotic moment, after all, and chaos is a ladder. The subsequent peace with France and the Habsburgs removed another obstacle to Wentworth's cooperation with the Crown. He opposed these wars and saw their conclusion as sensible policy. In December 1628, Wentworth ascended the social ranks once more, becoming a Viscount, and then, on Christmas Day, he became Lord President of the North. If you recall that Saville, his great rival, had previously been made Vice President and wonder if this was going to cause a hostile work environment, not to worry. Saville had been accused of accepting bribes from recusants. Now, he was a government official, so of course this was true, he was corrupt, and these accusations were enough to have him removed from office. So we have a vocal and public critic of royal policy now back in favour with the king. Granted, Wentworth had deliberately been careful not to alienate Charles with his actions in Parliament, but it was still a sign of one of Charles's strengths as a ruler. Provided one didn't go too far, there was always a way back into favour for the competent. However, Wentworth's name might have been in Charles's good books, but it was written in pencil. That's a bit of a strained metaphor to say that the king didn't fully trust his former opponent. It took almost a full year after Wentworth became Lord President of the North for him to also be appointed to the Privy Council. This was somewhat unusual. Later accounts, which are not backed up by official records, it has to be said, indicate that Wentworth only won the king's trust after he reported a document which claimed to be a government plan to rule without Parliament. His in-laws were implicated in distributing this libel, so if Wentworth did report this, then this would have only increased Charles's view of Wentworth's loyalty. Now, whether or not this is the case, Wentworth's relationship with his wife's family did sour around this time, though this is not the only possible reason. If the Earl of Clare's surname, Holes, sounds familiar, it should. One of his sons was called Denzel, and Denzel Holes had been and would remain a fervent opponent of Charles's policies. He was one of those imprisoned for his part in holding the Speaker of the House in his chair in 1629. Wentworth was being promoted, 
while his brother-in-law rotted in the tower. This would have made any family gathering somewhat awkward. As Lord President of the North, Wentworth did what he could to harm the interests of his old enemies, the Savills. Projects with their backing were repeatedly hampered, for example. While espousing his classic call for compromise between king and subject, he nevertheless took a hard line against those opposing royal, and therefore his, authority. When a local knight didn't show him the proper respect during council, he was arrested and forced by the Privy Council to make a public apology. Recusancy fines were ruthlessly collected from Catholics, though Wentworth was no zealot, just not as tolerant or easy to bribe as his predecessor. When Charles issued fines for failing to attend his coronation and be knighted, Wentworth collected them without complaint, and had a councilman who opposed it and accused Wentworth of skimming off the top imprisoned and fined. Wentworth reinvigorated the prestige of the Lord President of the North, as well as the Council of the North. He insisted on pomp during public events, and he restored the glamour of the official residence of the President. In 1623, Charles issued orders which gave the Council of the North many of the powers of Star Chamber. While his time as Lord President was a time of great success for his career, it was also a time of personal tragedy. His second wife, Arabella, had fallen ill while pregnant, and she died in October 1631. Her family blamed Wentworth for making her travel, further ruining their relationship. Wentworth was undoubtedly grief-stricken by Arabella's sudden death, but he nevertheless remarried shamefully quickly, within a year. I say shamefully, because even Wentworth kept the ceremony a secret, fearing the public outrage at such a swift change from bereaved husband to newly married groom. So, we are just about halfway into this episode on Ireland, and only now do we leave England along with Wentworth, in 1633. Wentworth had been appointed as Lord Deputy back in July 1631, but it took six months for the decision to go public, and it was only in July 1633 that he actually went. Wentworth and his allies were rightly concerned about this promotion. True, on paper, this was a great honour. Wentworth would rule a kingdom on the king's behalf. However, historically, the Lord Deputyship was a poisoned chalice. More than a fair share of Lord Deputies had gone to Ireland, only to be undermined and destroyed by their enemies back at court. Wentworth had developed a strong network of clients and allies in England, both in Yorkshire and in London. In Ireland, he would have none of these. He would start fresh, without friends and with ready-made enemies. He was not ignorant of the events of the last few years, nor of Ireland's complicated factions. The Lord Deputyship could cement his future, or spell his ruin. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and it's bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RecordedHistory. That's B A. B-B-E-L dot com, code recorded history, Babel language for life. 
Wentworth was well aware of the potential risks and rewards of becoming Lord Deputy of Ireland, and he had full confidence in his abilities. He had ruled as Lord President well enough, and saw no reason that this success could not be repeated in Ireland. This didn't change the danger posed by his position, and Wentworth was not about to sail to Dublin without making a few preparations. He accepted the position of Lord Deputy on three conditions. The first was that he would be permitted to visit court whenever he wished, without waiting for royal permission. This had tripped up Lord Deputies in the past. The Earl of Essex during Elizabeth's reign had left his post without permission, and he was arrested. With a guarantee that Wentworth could return at will, if his enemies at court began conspiring against him in his absence, he could rock up within weeks and speak to the king in person. The second condition was that Charles would not go over his Lord Deputy's head and make any grants of Irish land without Wentworth's knowledge or approval. This would help keep a single policy in Ireland instead of risking the king and his deputy publicly disagreeing over a grant. The third condition had a similar benefit to the second. Charles would not hear appeals against his Lord Deputy unless it was blatantly obvious that Wentworth was in the wrong. Previous Lord Deputies had been hampered by Irish aristocracy disputing their policies directly with the king. Under Wentworth, this wouldn't be possible. His word would be final. The king agreed to these conditions, though he refused Wentworth's final request, which was to be made an earl. With these conditions agreed, Wentworth departed for Ireland in July 1633, with three main objectives. To make Ireland pay for itself, to further anglicise the Irish church, and to quote-unquote civilise the Gaelic and Anglo-Irish. Completing these three aims would meet a fourth objective, to secure royal authority in Ireland, making Charles as absolute a ruler in Ireland as he was in England. On the first point, finance, Wentworth began work even before he left England. From reports and correspondence from allies, Wentworth knew the main problems facing the Irish government before he even arrived. The army was ill-equipped, poorly led, and in no state to fight a foreign invasion or suppress a rebellion. The church was impoverished and its clergy untrained, and corruption was endemic. Irish debt was around £76,000, was growing by £20,000 a year, and only the last subsidies won from the graces were left to collect, and these came to only £10,000. One potential source of income from a Catholic-majority Ireland was the enforcement of recusancy fines. Richard Boyle, 1st Earl of Cork, a new English landowner who had acquired most of Sir Walter Raleigh's estates, was in favour of this. Over the years, Cork had only increased his land holdings and his power, and was now the Lord High Treasurer of Ireland. Cork was in favour of increasing the fines, at least partly in the hope that this would alienate the Catholic Irish from their new Lord Deputy before he even arrived. This would leave Wentworth reliant on the new English, much like his predecessors. However, Wentworth preferred to keep this in his back pocket, holding the threat of recusancy fines, hanging over the heads of the Anglo and Gaelic Irish, and securing their cooperation, at least temporarily. Instead, Wentworth focused on increasing the collection of trade duty, and an additional year of subsidies would make up the shortfall. When Wentworth finally arrived in Dublin, it became apparent that these had only been stopgap measures. A parliament would have to be called. It bears noting, and I can't remember if I've covered this already, but Charles's personal rule was only in England. In both Ireland and Scotland, parliaments were called when needed, as we'll see, they went relatively well, but not well enough to convince the king that his wariness was unwarranted. As it was, Wentworth had his work cut out for him in convincing Charles that an Irish parliament was necessary. The main fear of the king was that a parliament would want to discuss the graces. After all, they had been bought and paid for through the subsidies. Wentworth assured the king that a parliament could be controlled, Revenue would be voted first, and only then would he allow a discussion of the graces. The king was mollified, 
and a parliament was summoned to meet in July 1634. Wentworth left little to chance. Not only did he bolster the Protestant majority in the House of Lords with new admissions to the Irish peerage, but in the House of Commons, Protestants likewise held a majority of 30 MPs. A third of the Protestant MPs also held offices in the government, so they were unlikely to vote against its policies. As it happens, the Commons voted, unanimously according to Harris, to grant six subsidies over four years, with the last two set £5,000 higher, and with an additional £9,000 from the church and the nobility. Once again, the Irish Parliament showed its willingness to cooperate with the Crown, and once again, this generosity and loyalty was poorly rewarded. The first session had secured taxation, and the MPs assumed that, as agreed, the second session over winter would secure the graces in return. Wentworth allowed them to prepare the statutes to make the graces law, only to refuse to agree to several key graces in the November session. One of the key graces which Wentworth refused, on the grounds that it would harm the Crown's rights, was the grace of a concealment act. This would have had the effect of blocking further plantations on vast tracts of land by granting rights to land after a set amount of time, regardless of whether the owners could prove it had been granted by the English Crown. This was one of the graces most vital to the Anglo-Irish MPs and lords whose lands were, year after year, stripped and revoked from them and granted to planters. Wentworth told the outraged MPs that the other graces were more than enough to compensate them for their six little subsidies. Naturally, the Catholic members felt betrayed, and they did what they could to hinder the government's business. Now... Wentworth's preparation bore fruit, as the Protestant majorities secured control of both houses. The remaining graces were not passed. It had been rocky, but Wentworth emerged from the Parliament with taxation and without losing control. It was a success, though once again financial security came at the cost of widespread resentment. This is where we'll leave off today. Next time, we will see how Wentworth attempted to achieve his other two aims, to reform the Church of Ireland, and to anglicise the Irish. Throughout everything, the Lord Deputy looked out for the King's interests, and this would earn him many enemies. Thank you to my House of Lords, which has gained so many new members that the Lord Deputy himself would be proud. Entering the chamber, decked out in their best ermine and fur, are Evan the Marquess of Londonderry, Nick Bunker, Earl of Kildare, Dylan Drollett, Earl of Waterford, Chris Emmerich, Earl of Desmond, and in addition, the former Baron Dexter is now the Viscount Dexter. Remember, you can join their illustrious ranks by going to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. All members of the House of Lords receive an ad-free RSS feed, meaning you can just pop that into your favourite podcast app and never have to hear an advert for Best Fiends again, at least on Pax Britannica. Remember, you can get in touch on Facebook, Twitter, and by email. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, new and old, and to you for listening.